this is going to be the title of our Bible study teaching. This is love. This is love. All right, well, with your Bibles in Luke chapter number six, I just want to remind us, because it's the beginning of the year, that our theme for this year is motivated by love. And there's some statements that we've been making nearly every week. I want to make sure that love is motivating our attitude and our actions. We want to make sure that the love of God is constraining us or compelling us to do His will. I want all of us to be motivated by the love that Christ has for us. And I think on Sunday, we started to get a glimpse at just how much God loves us and just how much Jesus loves us. And I want us to be motivated by the love that Christ has for us. But I also want us to be motivated to demonstrate the love of Christ to others. I want us to be motivated to demonstrate the love of Christ to others. There is a world out there that needs to know that Jesus loves them. And I want us to be motivated to demonstrate, not just to tell people, oh, God loves you or Jesus loves you, but to demonstrate the love of Christ. And so for the next several Bible studies, this is going to be the title of our Bible study teaching. This is love. This is love. And we're going to use Luke chapter 6 to help us to understand what love is. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus here is giving a sermon on kingdom living. Now, theologians debate whether or not Luke is recording the Sermon on the Mount or whether this is a separate sermon that just covered some of the same things that were taught in the Sermon on the Mount that you find in Matthew uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7. I'm not going to get into that theological debate. Let's just say Jesus taught the same thing or Jesus is recorded teaching the same thing both in Matthew and in Luke, whether it was one sermon uh, recorded twice or two different sermons, I wasn't there. Amen? And we don't want to minor, uh, major in minor things. But in both Matthew and in Luke, Jesus is teaching us on kingdom living. He's teaching us how to live as citizens of the kingdom of God. And it might be good for your own personal edification and study to read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, because it's a wonderful companion to Luke chapter 6. And they complement one another. Jesus in both Matthew and here in Luke starts uh, or makes a large part of his teaching, teaching on love. And it's interesting because we often reference the fact that Jesus taught on love, but we don't often reference the context by which he taught on love. Here we see in Luke, and we'll, you'll see it if you read in Matthew as well, that Jesus is teaching on love based on those who are difficult to love. Jesus is teaching on love, but he's teaching on love based on those who are difficult to love. It's very interesting when you study out the teachings of Jesus and you study out his teachings on love, often, most often, he puts love in the context of loving those who are most difficult to love. And we're going to see that when we start reading here in verse number 27. Because the first thing he says, but I say unto you which here, love your enemies. Now, there's nobody harder to love than your enemy, right? He starts off with love your enemies. And so the reason I'm stopping and spending some time here is because we often start going through what Jesus taught on love and we ignore that it was put in a context. And I believe the context is vitally important for us if we're going to demonstrate the love of Christ. So he says, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto, thee, and unto him that smiteth thee on the one sheep, offer the other, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take away thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh thee, and of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. Now we love verse 31. It says, and as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also likewise to them. But remember, verse 31 is still in the context of your enemy. 
Amen. Now that makes the rule a little bit more golden when you think about the context. He says, for if you love them which love you, what thanks have you? For sinners also love those that love them. And if you do good to them which do good unto you, what thanks have you? For sinners also uh, do even the same. In other words, the differentiation between the love that Christ wants us to have and the love that exists in the world is we love those we're not supposed to love. We love those who are difficult to love. We love those who the world would excuse us if we did not love them. Context is important. He says, if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thanks have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. Verse 35, so he lets us know the context hasn't changed. But love ye your enemies and do good and lend hoping nothing again. And your reward shall be great and you shall be children of the highest for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. You all see how this is letter uh, part B of Sunday? Amen. See, God is kind, not just to those who came out to Bible study tonight. Amen. And not just to those who are watching Bible study tonight. He's kind to the unthankful and the evil. Be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For which the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Notice the context of who he used as an example never changed. So even when it's talking about judging not, and being kind, and forgiving, and giving, the context that Jesus put this in did not change as we read through the verses. So let's go, let's take our time, let's go through some things. Let me give you the intent. The intent of this teaching is for us to understand the love of Christ. See, on, on Sunday, I'm going to be emphasizing understanding the love of God. And in Bible study, I'm going to be emphasizing us understanding the love of Christ. That is the love that he had for us, but more importantly, the love he desires for us to have toward others. So the love he has for us, but more importantly, the love that he desires for us to have for others. Jesus' teachings here in, Ma in Luke and also in Matthew, they're going to have to set our heart condition as believers. Jesus' teachings here in Luke and also in Matthew, they're going to have to set our heart condition as believers. But we can't get our heart condition set if we don't really understand the love of Christ, the love that he has for us and the love that he desires for us to have for others. The purpose of this teaching is for us to walk in love. The purpose is for us to walk in love. That's why we took the first three Bible studies of the year and looked at walking in love. Because I want us as believers and us as a church to live a life of love for God and for others. I want us as believers and as a church, I want us to be able to live a life of love for God and also for others. You know, there, there, are, there are a lot of uh, times you encounter church folk they have a lot of love for God, but not for others. And, and I want us to live a life of love toward God and toward others. I, I want us to conduct ourselves in love. J Jesus here in Luke 6 is trying to set our conduct. And I want us as believers to conduct ourselves in love. That means, that's what it means to walk in love. That means I'm going to conduct myself in love. I, I want to make sure that we progress through life in love that we progress through life in love. You know, you, you, can, um, 
You know, we like to uh, think about secular songs and love songs and Hallmark movies and things like that where people fall out of love uh, in a romantic sense. But, but listen, as Christians, we can stop loving. We can stop loving God and we can stop loving others. We can allow things to get in our heart or in our lives that will cause us to stop loving God. How many of us know we, have, we know people who had a love for God and now they don't? They're off doing other things, involved in other things. They, they've just turned their back on their relationship with God. And how many of us know that if you go through enough things and uh, enough people treat you a certain kind of way, that if you're not careful, you can get in a position where you stop loving others. And, and so I want us to walk in love. That is progress through our life in love. To walk in love means I want us to take advantage of every opportunity to demonstrate the love of God. You know, God gives us opportunities to demonstrate his love. And, and we want to take advantage of every opportunity that we're given to demonstrate the love of God. And so my goal or the goal of this teaching is simple. The goal is to manifest the love of God. Now, I, I am sure I have said this this way. So uh, I want to clarify so we have a clear understanding as we go forward. There, there are three descriptions of love that I have used often in this church, and they made up the three subtitles over the last uh, three Tuesdays of the other teachers. And I'm using the word descriptions because they're not actually definitions. I know sometimes I may say definition, but the word love has definitions. Th these are really more descriptions. And they're th these three descriptions of love that we looked at over the three previous weeks really come out of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and Luke chapter 6, and they come out of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And, and so when I talk about manifesting the love of God, we've learned that love is the biblical treatment of another person. So, so the way we manifest the love of God is that we have to treat people according to the Word of God. That's not a definition of love as much as it is a description of love. And if you look at Luke chapter 6, Jesus is giving us the treatment that we ought to have toward other people. He's outlining it in a biblical way. This is how we ought to treat people. We said that love is in our response, that love is not in how we're treated, but love is in how we respond to the treatment that we have received. Well, where did that description come from? It came from the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not respond. Uh, uh, he, he, his his love is in his response. He was beaten. He was scorned. He was mocked. He was whipped. He was crucified. But we see his love not in how he was treated, but how he responded to the treatment that he received when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, I don't know about you, but it, if you had done a fourth of that to me, I would have had a hard time saying forgive them because they know not what they do. Because somewhere along the line, I say, Father, they know what they're doing. And they're still doing it. So deal with them, because they know what they're doing. But Jesus, amen, he didn't respond based on what he received. He responded out of love. And we learned, and we've, we've had this third description, that love requires the correct action with the correct motivation. Love requires the correct action with the motivation. And again, we can see that in the teachings of Jesus, but we can also see that in the life and ministry of Jesus. Listen, we can also see that in the life and, and, and of those around Jesus. We know that Judas uh, came up and kissed Jesus. Listen, that might have been the right action, but it wasn't the right motivation. He, he kissed him as an act of betrayal. So everything that looks like love may not be love. Amen? And, and so my objective, we have seven objectives. Well, we have one objective. We're going to break it into seven parts. But the objective is to shape our attitude and actions. My objective is to shape our attitude and our actions. Now, I want to shape our attitude and actions seven different ways. I want to shape our attitude and actions first toward our enemy. I want to shape our attitude and our actions first toward our enemy. As Christians, we really cannot manifest the love of God until we are able to have the right attitude and actions towards our enemy. 
I want to shape our attitude. I just let that sit there. I didn't get any amen, so I'll just let it. I just, amen. I didn't even get a come on, Pastor. <laughs> to shape our attitude and our actions. Secondly, about giving. I want to shape our attitude and our actions toward giving. Because you cannot manifest the love of Christ without giving. Now remember, giving was put in a context in Luke chapter 6. Third, third, I want to shape our attitude and our actions toward being just. I want to shape our attitude and our actions toward being just. Verse uh, 30, when he says, uh, verse 31, he says, and as you would that men should do to you, do you also to them likewise. Jesus here is talking about us being just. And we'll talk about what it means to be just from, not from uh, God being just to us, but how we can be just to one another. And then fourth, I want to shape our attitude and our actions to be kind. I want to shape our attitude and our actions to be kind. How many of you know you can't be loving if you can't be kind? You, you can't be loving if you can't be kind. Now, children, don't try to go tell your mama, you weren't kind. That's, we'll get there, amen? Because that's not going to gender any more kindness. All right, then we want to shape our attitude and our actions. Fifth, to be merciful. To be merciful. Jesus said, be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. How, how many of you know that every once in a while you need some mercy? And I'm not talking about God's mercy. I'm talking about man's mercy. That, that means that other people need mercy as well. And then sixth, and I have a feeling when I get to the sixth one, it's going to take more than one week to get there. Uh, well, when I get to six, six is going to take more than one week. Uh, to shape our attitude and our actions about judging. To shape our attitude and our actions about judging. There, there are two things that I'm going to be working on a lot this year. One is learning to be unselfish. And two is learning to not judge. You, you cannot demonstrate love if you're selfish. And you cannot demonstrate love if you judge. And we're going to spend a lot of time, not just in this teaching and not just in Sunday, uh, but throughout the year, I'm going to be dealing a lot with us in terms of being unselfish and in terms of us not judging. My wife has kind of been hearing me warm this up uh, in my heart and in my mind over the last probably uh, three or four months or longer. But it's something that we have to get down on the inside. And then sixth, or excuse me, seventh, I want to shape our attitude and our actions to forgive. I want to shape our attitude and our actions to forgive. You know, it becomes easier to forgive if you can learn to not judge. Un unforgiveness is rooted in judging, in judgment. But, but if you can learn to not judge, it makes it easier. Listen, forgiveness is hard. But if, if you can learn to not judge, it opens up a spot in your heart to be able to forgive. And so for the rest of my time tonight, uh, let's subtitle. Now, those seven things are all right here in Luke. We saw those. Amen. So we're really just honing in on these 10 verses and really going to week by week dig in to make sure we understand what Jesus is teaching us and commanding us. So for the rest of my time tonight, just subtitle the message. Uh, or the Bible study, love your enemy. Yeah. See, this is love when you can love your enemy. Jesus taught love in the context of our enemies. Isn't that interesting? Jesus taught love in the context of our enemies. Now, Think, think about this. Context is key because that's what he did for us. He loved his enemy. We were his enemy. 
See, we were alienated and shut off from the life of God. The Bible says we were enemies of Christ. Come on, church. So when Jesus put love in the context of loving your enemy, he did it intentionally because he lived these verses. He was the example of verses 28, 27 through 38. He forgave us. He gave unto us. He was merciful to us. He was kind to us. We did hit him on the right hand. And he did turn the other cheek and allow us to smite him on the other hand. See, he, he was crucified. He, he took stripes on his back, crown of thorns on his head. And, and in the midst of his enemies crucifying him, he said, forgive them for they know not what they do. So Jesus taught us to, lit, to love in the context of loving our enemies. And then he demonstrated that love by loving his enemies. And he did it by loving you and me because we were enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, that's a different way of looking at it, right? See, context is key. So, so we don't have to use a whole bunch of um, creative examples when we want to understand what it means to love your enemy, we can just look at Jesus because he didn't just tell us this with no context. He taught us this, then he did it. Then he did it for me and he did it for you because at some point each and every one of us were or are an enemy of the cross of Christ. And yet he loves us and he gave his life and has asked nothing in return. See, we're thinking about like a few dollars that we gave somebody. Jesus gave it all. He died for us. And so context is key. So now an enemy here, there are two def definitions of the, this word enemy that I want to like hone in on, okay? Um, w one is more, is less threatening than the other. But both are by definition an enemy. So an enemy can be someone who is in opposition to you. So you're going left, they're going right. Just opposed. So an enemy can be anyone you're in opposition to. Now, there are lots of reasons in biblical times why Jesus had to say, love your enemies. Because, listen, uh, Jews were in opposition with Gentiles. Uh, Jews were in opposition with Samaritans. Samaritans were in opposition with Jews, you know. This person was in opposition, you know, the, the scribes were in, uh, in opposition with the Pharisees. Everybody was in opposition with everybody over something. And so when Jesus said, love your enemies, it didn't take them long to figure out who they were, their enemies were. Because at this time, the world was sliced up, into, their world was sliced up and divided with all sorts of oppositions. Kind of like today. See, there, there are a lot of people who we have opposition with. You know, it can be racially, politically, socially. You know, we have class warfare going on right now. People of different classes are in, you know, uh, working class versus elites versus, you know, geographically. You know, one, one of the things that, and, and uh, okay, this is, a, this is a, a statement that needs to be put in the context that I know we're in a pandemic and we're in COVID. But one of the things that is invaluable pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, is to travel, is to see the world. You know, it is, uh, it is easy to understand why people have opposing views to you when you go where they live. You know, this, this is a big country. And, and so if you live in this geographic area, you, you have a concept of the world that's based out of your geography. But if you just go a state or two down, there's a different context. You just go a state or two north, there's a different context. And, and God forbid you get on a plane and go five or six states away. And, 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 you'll, and you'll find that things that make perfect sense to you make no sense somewhere else. And you might feel that you're in opposition with someone 
or they may feel that they're in opposition to you, and it's really just a geographical difference. It, it's a proximity difference. It's a density difference. You know, uh, I, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a simple example. Now, no one on earth has probably said wear a mask as, any more than I have. I do it every Sunday, maybe, you know, the doctors and things, but I say it all the time, wear your mask, wear your mask, wear your mask, wear your mask, okay? And I could say, I just don't understand how pe these fools go out here and don't have a mask on. Well, if you live somewhere where there's 100 people in the town and every house is separated by a farm, wear your mask doesn't make as much sense as it does in the D.C. metro area where we live three feet from each other. 